Welcome, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. We have a fantastic show coming up for you tonight. James Keenan is back in the house. Coming up next. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. I'm author and researcher Mike Ricksecker. With me, as always, my co-hostess, Victoria Monday. And down in the chat room, Alina, moderating the chat. We have a fantastic show coming up for you tonight. Author and researcher James Keenan is back with us. Last time we saw him was just before that uh, conference, that UFO uh, mega conference that we were at together in Laughlin back in June. We had James on in May to kind of preview for us what he had going on since that time. He's had an appearance on Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, which he wasn't able to divulge to us back in May <laughs> what exactly that was that he was going to talk about there. And uh, I've seen it now. Victoria, naughty girl, has not. <laughs> but we are going to talk about that this evening, uh, as well as many other things, because James is into uh, a lot of interesting esoteric and historic research. So, James, welcome back. Hi, Mike. Hi, Victoria. Thanks for having Hi. me back on. It's good to see you. Yes, you too. <laughs> I see your I see your name go by in the chat all the time. So, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah you've yeah. had really interesting times. people that I'm. Yeah, it. You know, watching uh, watching them, it's my homework. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah we had uh, Katie right. Grabowski on lately, Trey Hudson, and uh, you guys were on that panel together at the uh, at the mega conference, which was just fantastic. There was so much information that day. I, I thought that was really well put together. Right. Thanks. Yeah, and there was Dwayne Ollinger from Line Frog mm -hmm. Ranch was the the other individual. It yeah, was excellent. Right. There was right. a lot of uh, data presented. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So. Speaking of <laughs> data, <laughs> where do we start? Like, you know, like I like I said, uh -oh. we had James on just before his appearance in Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. So we need to talk about this. And uh, I did. grab. I know you sent me some some photos, uh, James, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Woo -hoo! So but this was really interesting, though, how you were. um you know, basically studying the the magnetism the in the energy levels in the area across because you hadn't been on the the ranch uh, at this point, but you had taken these different readings that were basically on either side of it. Um, so you want to tell us a little bit about what you had discovered here, and then you, of course, were on the ranch there. Sure. So over the course of several years, I've been taking a just a tremendous amount of data points in uh, magnetometer readings, uh, which are basically, you know, reading the magnetic level at each location uh, on the planet. And what I was looking for was any type of anomalous readings, uh, either below or above the field, the standard field level, which was, uh, 50 micro tesla or about 50 micro tesla on the uinta basin especially around skinwalker ranch and the mesa directly above it and after several hundred data points uh, at multiple locations around petroglyph sites uh, blind frog ranch and at skinwalker ranch i came across four locations that read anywhere between a negative 14 micro tesla all the way up to about 50 micro tesla which should never happen uh that basically is saying that one of two things should be presenting itself is i should be standing in south america getting that read or there is something massively magnetic below ground uh causing uh this transient uh, readings to occur so there was one south of Skinwalker Ranch, uh, which was exactly 6.2 feet away from its southern uh, fence line. And uh, it was going up and down, up and down. And it was only, 
each of the data point locations were about six inches in diameter, so not too big. But I had also got two of those, as you can see, up at the very top at the north part of the mesa just before uh, Fort Duchesne, which is the uh, reservation for the northern Ute uh, Native Americans. And those were very similar. Uh, they were going anywhere from about a negative 10 all the way up to about 48, 49. So after doing this at other locations, uh, I was uh, invited onto the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch uh, because I had presented the theory that there were additional locations on the ranch that were uh, running in the same uh, line, the formation. And sure enough, on the triangle, uh, which is where they directly above, they've had these portals open and these UAP uh, appear uh, that they actually captured on the, the video and showed uh, during the course of several of the episodes in season one and two. There was again this uh, very atypical read right where I thought it would be. So my theory has been evolving as to what's occurring and I believe that there is a, a huge tunnel cavern system under the Uintah Basin and the Uintah Mountains. And I, I've, you know, over the course of the last year, a uh, good friend of mine, Chris Bartell, who worked for Robert Bigelow and Bass for six years, he, he was at Skinwalker Ranch for just over six years. He and I went to all these locations and, and uh, we also went with Tom Winterton uh, to one of them, uh, who's, a uh, on the show as well. And we, uh, got down in some parts, half a mile underground and we couldn't go any further because we ended up running into a sump, which is this large cavern that's filled with water. Now, two divers have been into that sump. It's approximately 1400 feet. Uh, the, the depth changes all the time. There's some very deep areas, some that are shallow, but they got to another cavern system and they tra traversed through that and got to another sump and they've never been any farther than that. And I, I'm pretty sure that the Ute and other Native American tribes and uh, cultures have over several thousand years. And I believe it traverses east, west, north and south goes all the way down at least slightly past Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, a lot of it is underwater, like at Blind Frog Ranch, you have their uh, cavern systems that are completely uh, inundated with water, which has made it extremely difficult to get down there and see if it's uh, connected to any mines or if uh, you have these sacred mines that were you know, known as the Mormon mine on that location or other sacred locations for Native Americans. And I have a lot of running theories that we're working through. Uh, there just seems to be all these intersections where, you know, it's crazy. You have what looked to be the ancient giants involved with it, which I've been uh, for years tracking and, and putting their migratory patterns um, all the way from, you know, the highest parts of North America, all the way down to Peru. And just for it to be a part of Skinwalker Ranch, it's amazing because what, you know, few people understand until they've seen me present is I was working on the basin at the petroglyph and pictograph sites and other sites with the artifacts way before I really, I mean, I, I had heard of Skinwalker Ranch, but I didn't care about it until I realized that it was, a huge part of what I was seeing in the petroglyphs and all this uh, oral tradition when you would interview the Ute uh, or other tribes, it, it was just incredible that everything is tied in. You know, you can look at Blind Frog Ranch even being tied into Skinwalker Ranch and all this. Right, they're so be. close. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I, I do want to talk to you about the Giants in a little bit because we talked briefly about that just before the show. Uh, but you know, watching, uh, you know, watching the episodes and seeing how, how everything played out uh, after your your presentation, you gave them this data. Uh, they actually you know, they they start digging, which they'd been really reluctant to start digging on Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, 
do you have a concern with what they might, you know, run into and hit, you know, when they dig? Because there's there are all these different ledges that you start digging on on the land, crazy things happen. Is that a concern of yours? You know, my concern is there seems to be a secret society uh, or a group of people that are watching very closely what people do underground. And it's for a very specific reason. There's a sacred site that we're really not supposed to know about. And I think it's tied into the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, for what reason, I'm not exactly sure. Um, maybe it's a, an alternate location, an additional cash mine. Uh, there could be other things tied into the underground system that have nothing to do with, you know, uh, gold or iridium. It could be uh, portals or energy sources that have been able to create uh, the portals that are directly above the triangle, because you even see it in the petroglyphs that are located at Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, I don't remember if you saw my presentation in Laughlin, uh, mm -hmm. but I presented I what looked to be yeah, it looked to be those, uh, the de Glocker, those bell, those Nazi right, the bells. bells. Yeah, it, it looked exactly like that post-World War II. Uh, there was a sighting of something uh, above the UK that I presented. Uh, I got it from Steve Mera, and it was almost 100% identical to what's in the petroglyph. And that petroglyph goes along with Navajo uh culture and it's even in a book uh, there was a book released in 1997 that shows this iconography and uh, a skinwalker which is the yinablushi to them that same type of uh, radiation or energy being shot out of the earth to a circular object out in space directly above the earth which you know it, it, come on it's a uap a ufo <laughs> right. so so there's just so many moving parts right now, and our plans are to really start focusing on three sites that uh, Chris and I have uh, been involved in um, hunting down, I guess you could say, through uh, interviews and some historical data. We were able to, to pull from some old uh, LDS Mormon journals from the, I believe it was the 1860s, and then... Uh, from other information, I, I don't want to really discuss quite yet uh, in regards to what we came across uh, at some cultural sites and underground. Fair enough. Uh, I know Victoria has some <laughs> questions about the cavern system I'm underneath. It, yeah. I, can we, can <laughs> but we just it also, say but, it? Come on, let's just say right, it. But it all, it, it all <laughs> seems connected. And go ahead, Victoria. I know you Hello want to go Earth. Over. Hollow Earth, let's just say it, you know. Hollow I mean, it's, we don't have a rooms to go sofa down there, but I'm sure people live down there at one time. Um, I did want to ask you about a Stargate you were talking about in um, Vernal, Utah, I think it was. Right. And you said they're all over the Southwest? They are. Uh, so I've located four petroglyphs that I'm 99% positive they are dealing with uh, some type of gateway. Uh, mm -hmm. How it's accessed, I believe there's two or three different ways to access them. Uh, every single one of these petroglyphs is located uh, at a recess into a rock wall where it looks okay. like a huge door. It looks like a door, yeah. With uh, some symbol above it or next to it, or they're underground uh, in a cave or a cavern system. And it's really interesting because uh, Round Vernal on the Uintah Basin in the mountains, I've located three out of these four uh, glyphs. And sure enough, one's in Dry Fork Canyon. The other one is underground. And another one is uh, at uh, Dinosaur National Monument. Are these in places where and, the general, and that's it. Yeah. Could the general public just accidentally stumble upon these? Or are these like on private locations? Oh, no, no. So, well, it's private. McConkey Ranch is Dry Fork Canyon petroglyphs. But... Mm -hmm. uh, the owners are wonderful. They've uh, opened it okay. to the public. You know, they ask for a small donation, which is on your own. You can put it in a box or not. Oh. And you can walk right up to this and see it. You can go over to Dinosaur National Monument, which is a, a quick drive uh, from Skinwalker Ranch or from Vernal. 
and I believe it's like eight dollars to get in. And it's the first uh, stop. It's Swelter Shelter. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Where it's it yeah, where it shows uh, all these different races or species or uh, anthropomorphic figures coming out of. Uh, I mean, it's an obvious portal. There mm -hmm. looks to be about six or seven different species and about twenty-five to thirty anthropomorphic uh, figures. And what's really neat is the big one right over to the left. Boy, it sure looks like a gray alien. Uh, you know, <laughs> really? from what we see, I, it's identical. But you got to remember, these were, uh, you know, carved out more than likely anywhere between uh, 2,000 to 700 years ago. So, you know, they weren't watching Sci Fi Channel and then going out and, you know, carving you sure? this on a rock. I'm Maybe. sure they, even the, <laughs> the, the anthropomorphic figure has four fingers where uh, other petroglyphs around this section, this rock art, have five fingers so they're yeah. showing that that's you know homo sapien sapien uh there's a lot of uh petroglyphs there uh, uh dry fork canyon where it has six digits and huge feet uh, obviously symbolizing you know the the giants of old yeah okay um back to the portal did you take any sort of magnetic readings there and um i think you also said in a um in one of your videos that um the portal could be opened by changing the vibration. Do you think drumming or any drumming circles or anything like that um, would raise the vibe? Ooh, okay. More questions later then. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, that's what we were trying to do like at yeah. Mineral Springs with well, yeah, uh, Coyote Chris is with, with the drumming to uh, put that vibration out there to open up the, uh, the, the possible portals that were there. Well, see, I always thought drumming would be such a low on the resonance scale that it wouldn't vibrate high enough but what do i know i don't i don't have a science degree um but anyway um well what, well, what do you think james <laughs> yeah i think it's a combination when you talk to uh several of the native american cultures in the desert southwest they have a combination of chanting and fasting and uh using drums or whistles or other type of devices to activate the portal now, I've also been told there's a different portal uh, where uh, an energy source is required and a key. And it's usually a circular rock with glyphs on it or a semicircular object that uh, is placed into a, a small recess within this doorway. And that's the final uh, device necessary to activate the, that type of portal. So it's really interesting. Uh, the other way they said is, you know, obviously to use hallucinogens, hallucinogenic uh, narcotics um, oh, as a yeah. requirement too. But it, it really depends on uh, which elder or which shaman, which medicine man or woman that you uh, talk to and their culture. But the end game is the same thing. Now, are they different portals or, you know, are some able to access you know, I, I have a feeling that where I'm looking at at 40 degrees there on the, the Uintah Basin, that there was additional, when you go across that 40 degree latitude line, you're hitting Sardinia. I mean, right where yeah. the Naragic people said these massive giants. And, and I'm not talking about like a, a mile off or two miles off. I am talking exactly to the to the line of latitude as it's, it's, these petroglyph locations. It's exact. Perfectly lined up, yeah. It, it, it's amazing when you see, up. yeah, when, when you see those lines drawn out like that, that that stuff is amazing. Uh, real quick, it did have, and I forgot to do this earlier in the show, Robert Hanna, uh, unable to make it this evening, but dropped down a $5 super chat just before the show. He says, we'll catch the replay uh. later. So I did want to recognize uh, that for Robert. So thank you very much, Robert, for being super chat superstar this evening. <laughs> Yeah, he sent me a picture of his dinner. It looked really good. <laughs> He'll do that, it's, yeah. He's awesome. <laughs> he is. But can I ask you about, um, I'm sorry, uh, Sego, no. I think, wait, Sego, is that what it's called? Sego Canyon. Sego Canyon. Um, there were uh, my favorite ant aliens there, and they were um, rather triangular. And it looked like they had some sort of, um, almost like a, a neck garb or neck necklace or neck something or another collar basically um with helmets attached and then they had like these tubes that would go to like their body 
cavity or something. Would that be like a breathing apparatus or do you think that was just decoration? You, you know, you have to look at the entire rock art uh, to see uh, all the anthropomorphic figures, uh, what's taking place. And, and I always tell people it's not just what's there, but you really have to look and see what's missing. When you're talking about early basket maker culture or barrier canyon style, 95% of what they did are these, the, it almost looks like you're looking at a science fiction movie or a horror movie and you're missing day-to-day -day life being carved into the rock art. There's mm -hmm. very few animals. When the animals are there, they look like they're in distress, either running away from what's occurring or they're amazed at what's taking place. And they're so focused in on the anthropomorphic uh, figures and what they're doing. Uh, some of them look like artificial intelligence. They look almost robotic and it's very dark. The, if it's a pictograph, it was, they used very dark colors in creating, uh, you know, the paints that they used. And there's just nothing that you can look around when you're there and say, oh yeah, I saw that, or that's what this is. It, it just, it honestly looks like you're watching uh, the sci-fi channel or your favorite horror channel. And you're talking about when you're talking about basket maker one or mm -hmm. barrier Canyon style, you're talking anthropologists and archeologists are willing to say 1500 to 1800 BC. But from everything that I've seen, and, and I've been doing this now for well over two decades, uh, And it's just, it's got to be thousands of years older, six, 7,000 years. Yeah. And even here at ASU, uh, at Deer Valley, they are now modifying their dating as to having said that it was six or 7,000 years back for the pe uh, petroglyphs here in the Phoenix area. Some of them are now saying 12,000 years. Okay, so, that's what I was... Yeah, I was going to ask you that because there was a one picture and it looked like an elephant. And I was thinking, well, there's no elephants. And so I did a little Googling and there was an ancestor of an elephant, but that was 13,000 years ago. And y'all were saying the pictograph was only like 800 years old or something. Um, could they possibly really be and still be around 13,000 years old? Uh, so I think that maybe they... Uh, we're here at the same time and there's some sort of catastrophic event took place uh, that obviously wreaked havoc immediately, you know, 99% of Homo sapiens sapien was wiped out, but so were these other uh, animals. The flora fauna was made extinct as well. Yeah. Yeah. It seems and, around the right time frame. But, yeah. yeah. But that's, but that's about the flood, that right? Brought that up. It, it, about the Great Deluge, yeah. But what's, yeah. you know, Victoria, I'm glad you brought this up, was think about Blind Frog Ranch, the title of the ranch. So Dwayne Ollinger drilled down, I think it was 65 or 68 feet, and blind frogs came up out of the hole. Uh, I think it was attached to the drill or whatever when they came uh -huh. out. Well, you know what that tells you right there is there's an underground yeah. ecosystem. Right. Didn't require sight because they'd been down there for so long in the darkness. Well, in 1970, they filled up uh, Bo uh, Bottle Hollow Canyon, which is directly above Skinwalker Ranch, turned it into Bottle Hollow Reservoir. In 2006, the USDA farm agency flew over. And in the history, I was able to find this massive subaqueous explosion underneath and caused a half mile diameter ripple effect on top wow. of Bottle Hollow Reservoir. And I verified with them that the, you know, the dot sit images were, were tested and, and it wasn't any type ball cloud cover. All of that was, was verified. But that tells me that for a subaqueous explosion or uh, enough of a buildup, um, and I talked, spoke to a geologist about this, there had to be a huge cavern system underneath for that to occur. Well, people have said they've uh, seen this huge dark serpent in Bottle Hollow Reservoir, and the uh, tribal police actually investigated a drowning that was associated to it. Well, why wow. couldn't a sinkhole form based of, you know, all that water it causes, you know, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. 
create sinkholes. What if it went into these underground cavern uh, tunnel systems that we know a lot of them already were inundated with water? What if something is down there, you know, from like you said, 13,000 years ago that existed on the basin? And if it was dark serpent, it would be dark because it doesn't need light, probably right. is blind, but it, it uh, felt the movement of these swimmers. So I agree with you, the wow. possibility of <laughs> yeah. something maybe being underground and then having an opportunity to come up, it might be there. And there may have been something that survived uh, just, you know, just like humans did. They had to go mm -hmm. underground. James, let me ask you something here, because <laughs> we're talking about petroglyphs with anthrop the anthropomorphic characters, uh, possible uh, creature that's still around from, you know, 13,000 years ago, underground caverns and all this crazy electromagnetic activity. And in some of the research that was being done there at, uh, at Skinwalker Ranch, you know, they're discovering, you know, signals that are either coming out of the ground or even originating uh, from space that seem to be coming down into the area. So uh, here's my question. Is it possible that, you know, under the ground there is some sort of ancient beacon that's calling out to the cosmos still all these years later that you know maybe they're associated with these with these people that are depicted in the anthropomorphic characters where it's, whether it's the ant people or, or somebody else coming through these possible stargates what do you think yeah that's an absolute possibility um, remember based upon the magnetic readings uh, not only did i locate a lot of uh, voids underground but I, I, and I know you saw this, I have a 3D ground imaging mm -hmm. and we found, uh, found metal objects and, and I showed that to everybody, you know, at, at four or five meters below ground, um, which is obviously some large metal object. Now that wasn't taken on Skinwalker Ranch, mind you, that was elsewhere on the basin, but it, it, it's absolutely possible. And think about it, you have all this energy uh, under the mesa, under the ranch, uh, that seems to be transient. So what if it is traveling through the water system that's underground and it's highly energetic? It could be uh, not just transmitting, but maybe it's even powering uh, these portals or these X points, these magnetic X points that are uh, several thousand feet above the ground um, and allowing uh, these portals to exist and for some other uh, object to come in and out of them. So you're saying they could have been harnessing the water to power whatever it may be under there. Or, or traveling, uh, using the water traveling. to travel. Okay. Uh, yeah. Since it's transient, uh, I, you know, I, I think water would just probably be the easiest way for something to maneuver underground uh, compared to, because if you think about it, if there was a rail system or something put in there, there would have been a lot more uh ground penetrating radar finds and uh, you know they flew the the larger magnetometer after me on the same episode and, and covered the entire ranch and um it, it's really interesting because there, there are some karst tunnels that you can see in that uh in the rock uh, but nothing that would have you know, been like, oh my gosh, that's a underground railway or something like that. And, and don't get me wrong, we're only looking, you know, that magnetometer can go so far. And I believe these cave and cavern systems go extremely deep. Uh, you know, we were a half a mile underground before we had to stop because of the water level. And uh, sometimes that water level, you can't even get near that location. Other times you could go even deeper into the sump. So was that maybe, water, was that water fresh water or salt water? Yeah, so it's fresh water, <laughs> but but under the Utah Basin, you have a moderately saline water system because remember that it was Eocene Lake Uinta 50, 60 million years ago. Uh, and Lake Uinta took up a good portion of Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. It was massive. Um, and, and it got uh, more and more saline at certain points and dried up and you know expanded and then again dried up so it could have locked in pockets uh mm -hmm. which are now underground causing that more moderately saline uh water level uh below the basin so yeah it's a mixture uh the fresh water comes okay. down goes in through the sinks 
uh, in the mountains and it enters the, the cavern, the void system. Okay. Now, I, I remember in Arizona, um, like up on the North Rim, we went up there all the time, up the Verm Vermilion Cliffs or whatever. That was part of the ocean at one time. Um, did the ocean go that far into Utah? Could that also contribute to some of the salt water? Or is it just everything dripping down eventually? So Victoria, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I've only, yeah, I've only studied uh, up to Eocene Lake Uinta just okay. based upon uh, location and information in regards to the giants, uh, where their cultural sites would have been back then. So uh, that probably be better kept for a geologist to, to answer that one. Okay. All right. We'll get to the Giants in just a moment. We do have a, a couple questions here from the chat. I know. I'm excited to get to that, too. Victoria. Yes. Yeah. Uh, from Sarah Youssef, what is it about the location that makes it attractive to these interdimensional entities? <laughs> so, yeah, good question, Sarah. Uh, again, it's that energetic levels. Um, there are certain spots on the basin that line up that are extremely energetic. Uh, Blind Frog Ranch is one of those. A uh, couple locations in the mountains and then on the Mesa above Skinwalker Ranch and absolutely several parts of Skinwalker Ranch. Um, they're highly energetic. And again, it, there, there's multiple theories being thrown around. I, I truly believe that this underground cavity system, it was probably more accessible back in the day. There's a fault line, a quaternary fault line nearby that hasn't been studied very much that I believe has been the cause of expanding the cavern system and at other times contracting by cave-ins or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it altering underground. But could there be site locations? There's obviously been huge meteor strikes in northeastern Utah that we have those pieces. You know, you're talking 60 to 80 pound meteorites. What if there's one so big that it was an asteroid that we're overlooking it because of how big it was? And it was so long ago that now all this uh, uh, geology is above it now, all different sediment formation stratigraphy has increased over millions and millions of years but there had to have been a massive amount of certain precious metals of iridium because the readings are just too much mm -hmm. of too many things for it to not be part of the picture and, and then for all these other treasure hunter stories about uh, native american culture having things like kershanab in that location, you know, these sacred mines. Well, what if they really were ancestral homes where people survived the catastrophic event and they're so sacred that uh, they're being watched over? Uh, many people have been killed, especially in the 18 and early 1900s that we know about searching for it. And um, I think there's just all these moving pieces that we really have to start broadening how we look at things and what we see, we have to look at with a current day viewpoint or, or our imaginations, because the technology that existed back then, I believe, is similar to what we have now. So when we see these certain objects or devices in the petroglyphs, what we have to remember is oral tradition was one of the few ways that they communicated. So maybe at some point they decided to uh, place it in rock art from oral traditions that have been going on for thousands of years before that point, and then thousands of years after it was created. Yeah. And then we have one here from, thank you for that, James. Uh, we have one from Mr. Cumin 2 the underground caverns, could they possibly lead to Chaco Canyon? Um, so, you know, I, it's that'd be a That'd be a heck of a cavern I, system. <laughs> right. Um, it, exactly. And, you know, this goes and I know Victoria is going to get excited. This would go to that middle Earth theory again. If you're at a great enough depth and you got to remember, there was a lot of uh, volcanic activity back then. If there were super volcanoes or multiple volcanoes altogether, who's not to say lava tubes and limestone uh, weren't created in that amount of uh, or that length? 
but uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure. Not I, I know that um, we're looking at mapping about maybe 25 miles in an east-west direction and then about 25 miles north-south. Okay, which is still pretty substantial. Yeah. Very much so. And then uh, one here from, and then we'll get to, then we'll get to the Giants. <laughs> then one here from our chat moderator, Alina. She asks, uh, does James thinks, think it is possible all the strange occurrences happen intentionally to scare people so the secrets stay hidden? Yes. So uh, <laughs> one of my newest theories is the Yinald Lushi, the skinwalkers, the shapeshifters, they're actually a mm-hmm. secret society that are guarding something. Um, what a great thing to create because uh, they were never heard of uh, 150 years ago or 120 years ago. It's very recent. So what if they decided, hey, uh, we'll borrow from the Diné, uh, the, the Yinald Lushi, the skinwalker, and use that because, you know, when you're out there late at night, I can't help but think about it, you know, running into something like that. I, I mean, <laughs> right. I, I'm prepared for it, but still, you, you know, every little thing you hear behind you, you turn around for it. And uh, what better way to keep people away from something sacred than by scaring them away? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I ask you one question before you get to Giants? Go ahead. Did you find an ice cave? Did I did I see that correctly when you were? I think you were on Blind Frog. Yes. It really had yes. ice. So there's a. You saw the photos, right? I, well, I, I, I didn't believe so, it. <laughs> no. Uh, so Mosby Mountain has a, a known ice cave, but uh, that one came from just north of Blind Frog Ranch, about a mile north of it. Um, tons of ice inside of the cave. How deep were you? Were you very deep? You know what? We had to maybe, no, not really. We were only maybe 100 or 200 feet underground at that point where all the oh. ice was. Wow. That's amazing because we have caves in Texas and they stay like around 76, 75 and no ice. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that was my yeah. first time of experiencing ice, you know, because you just don't get that here in the Arizona area. No, nope. nope. <laughs> it was cool natural refrigeration it, mike you've got yes. to look at that you got to watch that video it's it's on james's youtube it's amazing i'll okay. take a look because i haven't seen that one yet it's good it's good okay now on the giants so, go ahead now on the giants <laughs> all right so yeah before the uh before we started the show james was telling us some in- interesting information about giants in that area his research into the migratory patterns and even in Ireland connection. So now this is really fascinating. Go ahead, James. <laughs> sure. So when you look at uh, all the petroglyphs and pictographs in the desert Southwest, there are giants everywhere. Uh, when you speak to uh, the Shoshone or to the Paiute, uh, the, the Diné, the Ute, they all have their stories about giants, uh, whether they were the Cite Ka, which were the redheaded cannibal giants, or even the larger Starnake, which were the giants that were miners and had all these tools that uh, made sound. So they were either pneumatic uh, or electric uh, or some type of vibrational or frequency type of tools. Um, But they're all throughout the desert Southwest. And then I've been in Mexico, uh, Cholula, uh, up in uh, Randuelos de Alisco, Shiwakan uh, on the West Coast. And there's giants everywhere in the artifacts, uh, in the oral tradition of the Nahua people. Um, and so what I started doing years ago was I started tr- tracking it. Um, I would track oral tradition, artifact, and petroglyph pictograph. Uh, or Codex, which were the uh, ancient books of the Mesoamerican people. Not many survived, uh, you know, right. pre-Hispanic. Um, there's quite a few uh, post, but uh, I'm more interested in that pre-Hispanic, uh, but like the Toltec, the Maya, uh, whoever was at uh, Teotihuacan, um, they, even, they actually say that Teotihuacan and the Pyramid of Cholula were built by one of the uh the or the seven remaining giants that survived the great deluge 
So I had all that information with me, had been tracking it. I got interested uh, into the desert southwest, uh, even as far as to the Shumash in central and southern California. Uh, same thing, you have it out there. But as I zeroed in on the Uintah Basin, and remember, I knew about uh, Skinwalker Ranch years ago, I, but it was, you know, something I didn't didn't really care about at that point. I was interested in the Native American, ancient Native American culture. Well, as I got into Dry Fork Canyon, Dinosaur National Monument, I started seeing what seemed to be this origin or focal point for the giants. And they look to have originated in the Uintah Mountains and migrated outward uh, up to Wyoming, into Canada, uh, even farther out all the way to the Catalina Islands or the Channel Islands that are off the coast of Santa Barbara. Uh, they've gone out to the Ohio Valley, all the way up to upstate New York, down into Florida. Uh, I've tracked them into Arkansas, into Texas. And then obviously uh, we have all this, but origin seems to be in the Uintah Mountains based upon uh, age of the petroglyphs and these lost cultures. So like Barrier Canyon style, we don't know who they originally were. We're, We have a pretty good idea that more than likely the Fremont and all that, as they migrated southward, uh, they overtook the Mugion culture, the Hohokam. And eventually after like 140, 150 years of wandering around, ended up in Tenochtitlan and became the Azteca empire and, and the Toltec to a degree. But, the giants the larger giants originated in the uintah mountains a very long time ago they for they caused or took uh captive other uh, groups other tribes and made them work in these mines Uh, something happened they went underground very few of them survived when they came back up along with other homo sapien sapien the only way for them to survive was to mate with uh homo sapien and they became what now we consider as the cite ka which were a, a much smaller but still uh you know maybe six foot three to seven foot two seven foot four and the cite ka weren't wiped out until about 1760 ish uh in nevada and there is yeah. a lot of historical data for that yeah it, it's interesting james it seems to be like a a common theme where you have the giants mating with humans because they're starting to die off. I mean, you're telling the story here. I was just doing research earlier today in Alaska where you see that that story play out. Of course, you think of the Watchers and the Nephilim from, uh, you know, the biblical story. So why is this such a common recurring theme where they're, they're trying to interbreed with humans? Well, like you said, there was no one else left to, to breed with in their own race. Um, and you know, it just it just seems very worldwide, know, like it was happening everywhere. It, it absolutely well. Remember, the Great Deluge was, and other catastrophic events occurred. Uh, some other catastrophic event occurred that created the Great Deluge. Uh, we we know that it, something of such immense proportion occurred for that to have happened, and the only place anybody or anything could have survived was where underground and how long that was <laughs> you're talking you know most people you see these movies and they come back out after six months or nine months and that's bogus you know you're talking about hell the underworld you know all this tradition and mythology of people being so fearful of hell well where did hell come from it was from living underground for so long you know you look at places in turkey where uh 250,000 plus people could survive. It goes 13 stories down. There's so many different caves and and caverns in it that they still haven't gotten to everything. Well, that's not just there. I could only imagine what's under the Uintah Basin and the Uintah Mountains that the Native Americans are privy to. They know it's there because it's not mythology to them it's actual history and we got to start looking at it uh in that same uh, mindset that we've lost this history and we need to find 
the right history. So we can't can't say, oh, these were hunter and gatherers. You know, we were far more advanced than they were as Europeans. You know, that's just it, that's wrong. It's an ethnocentric viewpoint that that's just outdated. And we've got to move anthropology forward and be more willing to see that timelines go back uh, to a greater degree. Uh, a lot of geologists are even getting on board now and saying, yeah, you know, the, these uh, catastrophic events were more than what we thought they were. They occurred more often and the devastation was, you know, unheard of. So flora fauna was wiped out except for what a percent that survived where in hell, the underworld with the ant people. Victoria. <laughs> Victoria, I love my aunt people. people. I love my aunt people. <laughs> sure. um, you had um, re you were talking earlier or in another video um, about pictographs that were now submerged because of um, I think a dam was created or something. Were those carved pictographs or were they painted? And I was thinking if they were carved, couldn't people uh, go underwater and document them now? Well, remember that the water uh, devastates a lot of the rock. Mm. Uh, but to your okay. point, too, with this drought that we've had in the yes. uh, West, a lot of the reservoirs are so low that uh, we're starting mm. to find petroglyphs that, you know, we couldn't see for 50, 60, 70 years that we're able to look at again. Um, the pictographs are a little different. It depends on what was used uh mm. and how long they were submerged but probably most of those have been destroyed mm, that's a shame yeah it is a shame it's it's a crime almost well. <laughs> so let me ask you this james because mm. out here in ohio we have uh like serpent mound we have great circle earthworks which is absolutely huge and massive uh, and they and you know archaeologists say they don't know who built these some ancient culture that predated the uh the natives that you know the the europeans came across so do you think it's possible that the giants built some of these type of structures i, I do and, and i'm not the only one um you have a lot of uh from the 1800s and 1900s uh journals from uh, pioneers from mountain men that uh, came across artifacts breastplates swords and all these journals, you know what? They don't say giant. What they say is men of great stature. Mm -hmm. That's what they like to, the terminology they like to use. And these breastplates uh, are massive. I mean, you're talking, you know, some of them for people that are six, six, seven feet tall. Uh, some were eight or nine feet tall, especially around that area in Ohio. And, uh, I just love that term, men of, you know, people of great stature. Well, we, you know, we're talking about giants after a catastrophic event that are, you know, their, their DNA has been altered by mutating, having to uh, mate with uh, a race similar to theirs, but not quite the same. And what would happen, you know, genetically, the alleles would be altered and you would have a, a lesser giant, uh, but still obviously a lot larger than the Native Americans that were there at the <laughs> right. time. That's funny because I was telling Mike before we started, I come from a very tall family in East Texas. I'm just wondering. <laughs> yeah, we call, we call them towering Texans, but you know. Oh, there you, know, you go. You know. <laughs> hmm. So throughout the, you see the mid, late 1800s, early 1900s, you go through like newspaper archives and you will find a plethora of different newspaper articles, especially around America, stating they have found these giant bones. And it, it appears these giant bones, even though people, you know, discovered them again and again and again, have gone missing. Of course, there's a lot of theories as to uh, why that is and what was trying to be hidden. But do you think there's still caches out there of these giant bones that can be found to prove, hey, yes, uh, these giants did roam the earth out here. Sure, so a few things to what you said. Um, absolutely, uh, there is a lot that is not just still hidden away below our feet, but maybe is being protected. Uh, you also have to remember now that 
uh, there are so many laws in effect that you really cannot just go out and start digging. Right. Um, and, and if you find something, you better stop because, I mean, you don't want to end up in prison for two to ten years for, you know, removing uh, remains of the deceased. And, and, that, and that's totally understandable. I mean, I wouldn't want somebody digging up, you know, my grandparents out in the cemetery. Yeah, but um, other th and also in regards to what you, you said, so I've been through a lot of those articles and you got to think also the people that were finding these, they may have been thinking that some animal remains were uh, human remains, which would be incorrect. And then how the remains were laid out in the grave site. Uh, remember that you have to deduct a few inches from where the bones fit into the, you know, the sockets and the joints. So sometimes when people think there was something seven, seven and a half feet tall, it was really maybe six and a half feet tall. So how much of a giant was that? But when you're talking about 10, 11, 12 feet tall, it looks like a human's head um, or skull is around. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot being hidden. Now, part of my talk at the Laughlin Mega UFO Conference was on John T. Reed and all the boxes that were in uh, Reno that I went through. And he was obsessed with the Giants. He had hundreds upon hundreds of articles and nobody had really been through everything since like 1975 or 76 to the degree that I went through it. And it was just amazing that all this data has been collected and he had conversations with uh, President Harding, the Senator of Reno, wow. JP Morgan Chase was interested in some things that he was doing. Hmm. Uh, and just makes you wonder, you know, what the hell were these individuals so interested in what John Reed was doing in Northern Nevada? Um, there had to be a significant reason for it. If they're interested. There had to be significant reason for it, right? And, and sure enough, there, there's a lot out there. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it's on you know the reservations, and mm -hmm. uh, or it, it's just been destroyed, or it's too deep below ground. Um, it's in private collections that you know they're obviously not going to tell anybody about because they don't want them confiscated right. or. And so recently I've been running into an issue with this. Uh, when I would, I send a freedom of information act, I'm getting these notices that they can send me certain parts of it, but not everything because of the native American, uh, acts that are in place since 1979 to protect, uh, you know, native American remains. Uh, you can't even look at photos anymore of oh, wow. any of the old remains. Yeah, that's a, it's all restricted now. So my job is becoming a lot more difficult. Oh, um, cut off. And James, we lost you there. Uh, am I back? No, nope. we lost your audio. I can't hear him. Yeah, right at the end oh. here, we lost his audio. Go figure that. Can you hear me? Am I back? No, nope. I can hear everybody. I, can I hear, hear you, Victoria. Do you hear him? Yeah. Okay, so I lost it. Okay, it's on me. Okay, we'll Go talk. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria, it's you and I now. <laughs> Woohoo! My plan worked. Okay. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that's fascinating. Where do you think, do you think they, they originated in one spot and just migrated everywhere? Or do you just think they like, were like everywhere? Well, no, obviously there has to be origin. Uh, mm -hmm. There has to be an origin point for everybody. Uh, where that is the, the, and how long ago, who knows? Um, when I say the Uintah Mountains as an, an origin point, I'm talking from what I've been able to track and what's uh, here in the Americas. I'm not taking into consideration in Europe, you know, like right. in Sardinia or in, uh, you know, ancient Persia, uh, those locations. But uh, there's obviously, you know, you go to the United Kingdom and to yes. Ireland and there were giants there as well. I'm so, really excited about that. You should come to Ireland with us next year and you could do some giant research. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I told you I can get you into some of the carns you can't get into. <gasps> That's right. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to hook up 
<laughs> is my especially in low crew. Oh my gosh, we're gonna go to so many amazing places. It's it's. Oh, Mike, you back? I guess not. Anyway, so what else do you have going on? You seem to be busy. I try and keep up with you, but <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I, I have. Uh... I'm headed back up to uh, Vernal. The uh, very first Phenomicon uh, starts oh. on Thursday. It's uh, the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh -huh. um, all the Skinwalker Ranch team will be a part of it. So will all the Blind Frog Ranch team. Uh, Tom uh, Dongo will be there. Uh, Chris O'Brien. Uh, Travis Walton will be there. Really? Ooh, that sounds fun. Yes. Oh, wow. it's going to be great. Um, a lot of information to uh, present and uh, also to be able to hear so much more. Uh, Meldrum will be there talking about uh, uh, Bigfoot. So cool. that should be very interesting. You know, I'm volunteering so, yeah. my and services. Then, <laughs> if you need a gopher, right? I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Then the, uh, the following week, uh, the 17th through the 19th, I'll be at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles, California at the Conscious Life Expo. Ooh. And uh, I'm going to be talking uh, about the underground um, technology, consciousness, uh, Skinwalker Ranch. Caroline Corey will be uh, speaking with me, and it's going to be hosted by Jimmy Church. So it should be oh. uh, really exciting. I I'm excited. Now, is that one going to be virtual also, or do you have to actually be there to Both. take part? Okay. Because some of us yeah, don't so get the to Phenomicon, leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Phenomicon will be uh, in person only. Conscious Life Expo is a cross between LA and London, and uh, it's live at both locations, and it'll also be uh, online as well. Oh, that sounds so fun. I think yeah. we lost Mike. I don't know. Is Mike still there? Okay, I think he's gone. I don't think oh. he is. Can he see us? We could talk about hollow earth more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, he heard me. <laughs> I can't hear. I'm, I'm trying to fix it, but I can't hear. Oh, okay. Well, darn. <laughs> okay, well, I had more questions. Let's see. Um, I can hear the test audio. When I put the uh, the these earbuds in, I can hear the test audio, but I can't hear you guys, so... I don't know what that means, but um, the Shumash Indians, they seemed really fun. I mean, they were flying around on a cigar shaped um, mm. thing through the air. I mean, they just seem like a fun group. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, and what's interesting is the Shumash uh, don't even look like other Native Americans. They no. were able to grow full beards. Uh, they really? they had. Yeah, uh, they looked like almost like they had some European DNA in them. Um, it, it's just an interesting culture. Uh, their civilization was uh, all the way from the, you know, the Channel Islands in towards the desert regions of California. Uh, Santa Barbara was where they were heavily located. And they made some of the most amazing pictographs using uh, colors in their paint that to this mm -hmm. day have survived uh, w with orange and yellow and greens and reds. And, and you see all this action taking place up in the sky with uh, anthropomorphic figures on mm -hmm. them. And, and they're entering to what, what looks like spiral doorways yes. or gateways. It, it's just, it's phenomenal. And, and they've done this in a lot of caves or, uh, in shelter areas and luckily because of that a lot okay. of it's been able to survive yeah um you showed a picture of one and they were calling it a shield but when i looked at it to me that's what it would look like if you looked up and saw a ufo flying over um like with the energy pulsating and, and just zipping on by but i don't know if that's what it was or not but that was amazing okay yeah, i'm back by the way <laughs> oh hi Oh, hey, Mike. Um, oh, he, he agrees with me that the earth is hollow. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you missed the Shumash. They're, they're a fun group. I missed that, huh? Okay. 
Oh, it's really I'll, I'll watch back and, and catch the <laughs> clip that I missed. So. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. So, okay, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. We're right at the end of the show, too. Oh. So I made it back to end the thing. Um, but I do. Uh, there are a couple <laughs> questions here from the chat that I want to uh, to grab real quick. Um, so from Sarah Yusuf, can some paths of giants be cut off by continental drift? Yeah, I mean, for for any uh, any type of animal that that was absolutely yeah, that, that took place. But you, you got to remember that you're going back uh, hundreds of millions of years. And there's you got to think about the glacial periods, the interglacial periods. Right. So there's a lot of geology, a lot of geography that comes together for that. And migratory patterns of, uh, you know, not just Homo sapien, Homo sapien sapien, but other hominids, including the giants. Yeah, yeah, we're talking and, long you know, stretches even the flora of time here. fauna. Yeah. yeah, what 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 was there, you know, the the flora fauna that they were following or collecting, you know, um, is also another important aspect of that. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question. This is from Private for a Reason. Is there a possibility that the Knights Templar could have traveled to the Southwest? I was thinking that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting because mm -hmm. there's uh, the compass and square uh petroglyph on skinwalker ranch oh. and uh it, is it who knows i i think it may have something to do with marking uh, an underground system but in the late 1800s the ninth black cavalry was stationed there at uh, fort duchene and i believe like 94 or 96 percent of the african american soldiers were freemasons Oh. So, uh, you, you know, they seem to be very <laughs> interested in that Mesa and huh. Skinwalker Ranch area. The plot so, thickens. <laughs> the plot dun, dun, thickens, dun. yeah. <laughs> were, were they looking for <laughs> something from the Knights Templar? Who knows? All right. So we are at our hour mark and I need Aww. to go ahead and finish up. But uh, James, it was a non another wonderful time. We didn't even get into the Ireland connection. Oh, we did. The, uh, did. We did. Yeah. did. I missed that part. I missed that part. Yeah. Okay, great. It was just a smidge. Yeah, He's okay. coming with us next year, by the way, and he can get us into certain places. Oh, cool. <laughs> that would be great to have James along. Wouldn't it? Oh, my God. It, it would be. be. It would be. Yep. Next July 1st through the 9th. So, uh, James, oh, where, can, yeah, <laughs> where can everybody find more information about you, pick up your books? And I didn't even show the books. Let's, let's bring oh. the books up here. Hey, can he I had a free... He had a free download a couple I weeks ago. I got it. For some I did. reason, I don't even have the... Uh, Good. Here we go. It's taking a second because I hadn't uploaded it. But there we go. Yep. You can uh, get those uh, at Amazon. I have an author page. Uh, or at Barnes & Noble as well. And for those watching I here on YouTube, a, you can get the uh, the link down there in the description. But go ahead, James. I'm sorry for cutting you off there. Oh, perfect. No, no. Yeah, that's perfect. Look at the link down there. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you know, uh, Mike, you, you missed it. Victoria and I were talking about uh, Phenomicon and Conscious Life Expo, but I'm really excited mm -hmm. for October 2nd and 3rd because uh, you and I are going to be together again at uh, yes. Las Cruces, Las Cruces uh, Paracon. Last Christmas, yes, and this is, I, I'm, I have to ask you how you swung that one since it is your anniversary <laughs> and you were in trouble <laughs> last time I talked to you. Oh, man, it. yeah. Yeah, what, so how, how did you yes. talk Lisa into it? <laughs> yeah, well, you were there when I asked her the first time and her mm -hmm. face said it all, that it was a no-go. <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, she's originally from El Paso, uh, so she's pretty excited. Her parents and a lot of our friends and family uh, are going to be coming out to Las Cruces. Oh, great. And so we're pretty excited. Uh, I, not many of our friends or family have gotten to uh, hear my presentations. So this will be a first for them. And uh, it's nice, you know, to, to be back in that area because Las Cruces is just amazingly beautiful. And uh, the people there are just uh, fantastic. And, and to uh, have spent a week 
next to you to be able to spend, you know, two more days. Heck, Uh, you're too kind. I'm sure that was part of Lisa's too. She was like, hey, Mike's going to be there. (laughs) I appreciate that. It's going to be great seeing a a friendly face down there in Las Cruces uh, because a lot of people that are at this Paragon, I'm not too familiar with. So this will be uh, really interesting. And again, great to see you again. So, And this will be for virtual also? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think it will be. Yeah. Rats. Well, just make the drive card. from Texas. I will be in West Texas that weekend with Daniel and uh, oh, Randy. with Dan Class. Yeah, 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 right. Okay. Well, our <laughs> well, in any case, James, again, thank you very much for joining us. Always informative, always very interesting. So, oh, yeah, we'll oh, see you in a month. Me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Take care. Yeah, yeah, you have a great bye, night. Victoria. Bye. See you later. You too. Thanks. Take care. <laughs> bye. All right. So that was we- <laughs> interesting. That was weird. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but you know, Mercury. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> I love talking to James. He's so much fun. He is. He is definitely a lot of fun to talk to. So he's he is just so informed, and he's oh, yeah. he's been out there in the field doing the research. Yeah, great guy. So I've, I've decided next summer I'm going to um, lend my services. So I'll be with James one week and I'll be with Katie digging. And then Trey and oh, I will be go. out there. We're going to be geocaching somewhere. So I'm just I'm just going to make the circuit. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> so um, there was a question that came up. And I didn't want to post it while James was on because. Um... Bless, Excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. <sighs> Okay. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this one here, because it's it's not James's book, and when we have James on, we're pr- promoting him. Right. Uh, but the question is, do you guys know about Graham Hancock and his books about ancient civilizations? His latest is about American continents. It says before America. The book is America before. It, it's let me get my finger. Right. It's right there on the bookshelf. Okay. That one. I do follow him on social media. He's really yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, it's f- another fascinating guy, very uh, informed. But, uh, yeah, that book, America Before, has a, a lot of interesting material that um, he's, he's got connections uh, to the Americas from, like, Egypt. And uh, he gets into the different mounds and, and stuff that we were talking about throughout this this past show. But, um, but yeah, James is out there. Um, getting into a lot of other stuff that Graham hadn't. So, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of different material that, that he's touching on. It would be a good show. <laughs> it would be. It yeah. would be. Yeah, interesting. So, <laughs> all right. Let's go ahead and get to the shout outs. So, Alina. Thank you very much for moderating the chat this evening. Uh, we did have Super Chat Superstar this evening, Robert Hanna. So, Robert, thank you for being a Super Chat Superstar this evening. Let's get to the uh, participants tab, tab here on YouTube, which only shows like six people. And <laughs> no, there's yeah, more. There's more <laughs> than that in the chat. But Andrew and his trucking gnomes, Debbie 08, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, Hunter Road Media's Fairy Queen, Diane Hilbert. Helen Espinoza and Mary Hager. Thanks for joining us tonight. And then I'm going to scroll through because we had all, all kinds of other people. Um, <laughs> Giants. So, right. And the one that I just showed, <laughs> Oberon Osiris. Greg Koss was with us the entire hey, time. Uh, Thayer was in the house. Good to see you, Thayer. I know Adam Tiller is lurking down there. Always is. Uh, Mr. Kuman 2 Good to see you. Uh, let's see. We had EEQQ in the house. Lindsay Rutledge stopped by to say hi. Of course, uh, Sarah Yusuf, uh, thank you for the questions. Donna Abbott was with us this evening. Uh, Stacy Comiskey, thanks for joining us once again. Uh, Leslie Cohoon, thanks for joining us tonight. And there was Katie Palmer, great to see you. Uh, let's see who else. Mike Archer uh, joined us tonight, as well as TFT Tarot for today. And uh, <laughs> there Helen, <he> is. Yeah, <laughs> Helen Espinoza and uh, Nick Graves, thanks for joining us. So, all right. Uh, yep. And there's, uh, there's Adam. <laughs> Popped in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, everybody. Um, really thank you for joining us this evening. Next week, 
We have Andrea Perrin joining us. Uh, her first time back here in probably almost a year. I think it's been a while. Uh, but mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about all the crazy stuff going on at her old home, uh, the Conjuring House, and things that we discovered during the Shadow Dimension docu series. So, mm -hmm. And this is, yeah, and this is just before um, I'm going to see her out there at Massachusetts, Mass, Mass Paracon, Massachusetts Paracon, uh, that weekend. So. I'm well, tired just trying to keep up with you. I know. We're all over the place. Yeah, because we were just in Michigan. Um, yeah, we went out to, to Chris. Yeah, yeah, we went out to Illinois for uh, to pay our respects to Chris. Got Mass Paracon coming up. I'm actually doing something this this weekend for um, uh, it, with, with Brian Cano and something he's doing for his group. So um, you guys didn't hear that here. Is it the Hollow Earth? <laughs> No, <laughs> nothing to do with Hollow Earth. What you think um, about your bring about? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, of course, like we were talking about uh, with, with James on Las Cruces and then uh, Vulture City after that. You're going to so, enjoy Arizona. It's beautiful. So, uh, I've been to Arizona. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the perfect time of the year to go. It's still warm. It's kind of cool. Getting cool. Mm -hmm. well, when you're there, it'll be kind of cool. Yeah. So. Um, and then for tomorrow, we, this is for connecting the universe, which I guess I ought to put that banner up here, uh, for the keepers, of the connected universe, join us, connectuniverseportal.com. Uh, we're going to be getting into more secrets of the Alaska triangle, all that stuff we were talking about with giants in Alaska, plus a bunch of other things. And, uh, cause the Alaska triangle season two is premiering here this Friday. So. And the woolly mammoths? We can talk about woolly mammoths. In, in Alaska? They're still there. They they very well may be. I, I, all joking aside, I really do think they are. I, it wouldn't somewhere surprise me. It would not mm -hmm. surprise me if there's yeah. a small pocket out there somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah, we covered that very briefly in, in season one. Um, I have to go back through... Uh, last week, because we, we did, well, it would have been the week before, we did Alaska Triangle stuff and Connecting the Universe, and I don't know if I mentioned the Woolly Mammoths or not. I'd have to go back through. I have to rewatch everything. Yeah. Well, I'm going to yeah. have to just to make sure I don't cover the same stuff again. Yeah. Yeah. So, because we got to the point where it's like, we we're past the hour, and I still had like a little laundry list of stuff, and it's like... <laughs> you know what you need? Next time around. Two hours. That's all I'm saying. I'm not doing two hours. <laughs> two hours on Wednesday, you know, and you're connecting. I mean, I do, it's an interactive class. I mean, all the stuff that I put <laughs> together for that an hour's good. You get four to five of those per month. So <laughs> it's a lot yeah. of material. It is. It is. So I get the replay, but you know, <laughs> all right. work, so, work gets in the yeah. way. All right, everybody have a great night and we will see you next time. Bye.